In a world overrun by demonic creatures called wild beasts, humanity huddles within fortified gathering places. These structures segregate citizens into upper and lower cities. Tamers, humanity's strongest soldiers, raise beasts from eggs, forging a bond that allows them to command these powerful creatures against the lurking dangers. A lone boy from the lower city dedicates himself to the grueling training to become a tamer. On the final day, he barely qualifies, but unbeknownst to all, hidden talents bestowed by heroes from another timeline reside within him, waiting to transform him into humanity's next hero. On a fateful day in the past, the sky is veiled with stormy clouds and lightning crackles as far as the eye can see. A dragon is struck down by a bolt of lightning, crashing from the ominous sky. Not just one dragon, but dozens of lightning bolts rain upon an entire pack of the pitiful reptiles, causing them to plummet to the ground. The corpses of these giant beasts fall into Dust City, humanity's last stronghold in the war against an unstoppable force, fate. Corpse upon the corpse of the majestic dragons pile up, the powerful creatures dropping like flies. Suddenly, a sonic boom reverberates as a vermilion shooting star rapidly descends amid the lightning. This, however, is not a shooting star, but the embodiment of humanity's might, the great ancestor Leon's red dragon. An old saint with a graceful long beard, holding a golden staff, laments the fall of ancestor Leon's dragon. A young man, add to the timekeeper, phases in through a portal next to the man, who is revealed to be the great sage. He brings the dreadful news that humanity has no moves left and will soon perish. The timekeeper requests the great sage to leave the current era, without hesitation. Addo offers to use his body and soul to open a path into the past, allowing the great sage to change the fate that has befallen humanity. Addo has full faith in the sage's wisdom and, with a sign of respect, offers his reverence to the bearded man. With the visage of a man who has surrendered all hope, the great sage informs Atto that no one can break the strings of fate while the forbidden gods of time are watching. Nevertheless, the old man strikes the ground with the hilt of his staff, initiating a powerful spell. Golden magic waves radiate from the ground, birthing a magic circle. A tornado of magical energy surges, enveloping the old man. The great sage ascends into the sky, surrounded by various magical books and particles shining brilliantly. Holding a golden book with the face of a crimson dragon, he declares that the duty of altering mankind's fate will be left to people of another era. With his final words, he shoots a beam of pure light magic into the sky. The enormous magical circles and their powerful aura emphasize the sheer power of the spell cast over humanity's last stronghold. The beam of light magic, however, meets a demonic presence in the sky. A dreadful voice echoes, shattering human morale as it speaks of their inevitable fate. Emerging from the clouds, the ominous presence bears three pairs of demonic violet eyes and hair-like tentacles that writhe eerily. It consumes the great sage's beam of light magic. Atto and the great sage recognize it immediately as the dreaded forbidden god. The forbidden god's tentacles encircle the radiant light magic, proclaiming that any hope humanity holds will be devoured by despair. Its voice resounds with despair, foretelling the loss of the passage and the inevitable reduction of humans in this era to dust. With a solemn expression, the great sage proclaims that they are not mere humans, but the champions of humanity. He raises his staff towards the sky, and particles of light start emanating from both the great sage and Atto. The sage declares that the monstrous deity will face the combined power of human bodies and souls transform into thousands of pieces of magical dust. On the ground, the soldiers pause their battle, turning to witness the radiant magic unfolding. They realize that the wise old man has initiated the sacrifice ceremony. Sending a plea to his comrades, he urges all warriors to join him in humanity's final stand of this era, transforming their bodies and souls into the magical dust that will bring hope. Without hesitation, the despairing soldiers offer themselves as sacrifices, pledging to embrace their path toward death without regret, as their bodies begin to dissolve into magical particles. Empowered by the sacrifice ceremony, a surge of light bursts forth, shocking the forbidden god and revitalizing it. The light energy and magical array surrounding the deity waver with unprecedented strength, carrying the hopes and wishes of past generations to the future. The beam, having vanquished the monstrous deity, arcs into space, sowing the seeds of hope for generations to come. The scene transitions to the present era, known as the Olden Days, where humanity coexists with wild beasts as partners. In safe havens called Gathering Places, humans venture into a world teeming with dangerous monsters, aided by their beast companions. One such stronghold is the Black Light Gathering Place, 
situated on the edge of the treacherous wasteland known as the Dangerous Wasteland. This century-old castle has been led by the Fort Master, an aged yet dignified man with grey ashen hair, adorned in majestic armor and a flowing coat. Legend has it that he has safeguarded the Blacklight Gathering Place, since its inception a hundred years ago. Inside the Blacklight Gathering Place, a boy reads a job board under the lamp light. He studies an ash-grey recruit and notice, adorned with a lovely dark blue ribbon. The novice declares that one may join at their own risk, to become a gathering team member if they successfully hatch a beast egg within three years. Failure results in execution. Our protagonist sighs, holding the blue egg against his chest. Seated on a nearby barrel, he cradles the egg in his lap. Despite his outwardly calm demeanor, inside he panics knowing tomorrow marks the end of his three-year deadline, with no signs of his egg hatching. Gazing longingly at the sky, a shining star suddenly catches his eye. As he wonders about the trailing beam of light, it swiftly descends and strikes him squarely on the forehead, knocking him off the barrel. As our hero lies on the ground, with the blue unhatched egg beside him, he dreams of a dark red dragon floating under a night sky. In his dream, both the red dragon and an enraged green dragon roar, until a warrior lands on the red dragon's back with lightning trailing behind. Suddenly, the dream is interrupted by a frustrated trainee, poking our hero's cheek with a whip. Standing over the drowsy protagonist, the angry man with purple hair reminds him that special training members cannot stay overnight in the castle. As people start to gather, the man's anger escalates, pointing his whip at the still sleepy boy and demanding an explanation. Our hero realizes he has spent the night there and that the vision of the red dragon and its rider was just a dream. As he sits there, reflecting on his vision, the impatient man becomes increasingly furious, muttering to himself and finally striking the boy with his fist leaving a cut on his left cheek. Our hero touches the tender cut, while the sadistic trainee reminds him that today marks the end of his three-year deadline. Adding insult to injury, he informs Suhan that for breaking curfew, he faces a punishment of twelve lashes, leaving him stunned with fear. Crack. Suddenly, the blue egg fractures at its apex, catching the attention of another trainee, who points out that Suhan's egg has cracked open. All three of them turn their gaze to the sky-blue egg, Su Hung is overwhelmed with joy, as he gently touches the cracked beast egg, lifting it above his head in triumph. Phew, that's a relief, so he won't get whipped or executed in the end. The sadistic man with the whip turns pale and grows cold with fear at the realization of what he has done. He attacked a newly hatched member of the renowned gathering team. He starts making excuses like a defeated man, while those around him regard him with disdain, silently wishing Su Hung success. He even offers to summon the officials to officially recognize Su Hung as a rider now that his egg has hatched, but his words are cut short by a commanding voice. Both men turn to see a gallant woman, her legs adorned with stockings. It is none other than special training official Lu Yu. She instructs Su Hung to attempt communication with his newly hatched egg. Su Hung looks down at the egg in his hands, bringing it close to his face. He expresses to the little beast how eagerly he has awaited its hatching, and the egg responds with a rumble. The little one has some attitude. Su Hung gladly shares the egg's response with Lu Yu, who responds with a laugh. Patting his shoulders, she exclaims that another rider is welcomed by the Black Light Gathering team. However, her expression suddenly turns grim. She asked about the cut on his face, prompting our hero to point directly at the sadistic man who struck him, still surrounded by the gathering crowd. Lu Yu glares at him with disdain for attacking a rider and announces a punishment of twenty lashes in exile to the gathering lands to fend for himself. Su Hung smiles with satisfaction as the purple-haired man falls to the ground in fear, pleading with the beautiful woman to spare him, while she escorts Su Hung to the castle. The scene shifts to our hero and the lady with enchanting hair, facing fortress master Zhou He. The old yet graceful man in his white suit assesses the new rider before him. Lui reports that Su Hung was supposed to join the search team, after failing to hatch his egg within three years, but miraculously succeeded on the final day. She suggests that he should be rewarded for his perseverance. Jovi compliments Su Hung's determination, chuckling warmly. With a serious expression, the fortress master presents Su Hung with two options. He can opt for dragon scales, which will accelerate the hatching process of his scaled lizard and may even enhance it with the dragon's bloodline effect. Alternatively, he can choose another wild beast from the master's collection to raise in the future. Without a moment's hesitation, Su Hung confidently selects the option that offers immediate benefits, stating that dragon scales are the better choice for him. 
The fortress master nods in agreement, declaring that he will send the scales to Suhung's home by the afternoon, expressing high expectations for our hero and his future contributions to the Black Light Gathering land. Su Hung acknowledges this with a salute, placing his hand over his chest. It is then observed that the inner district of the Gathering Land features the castle and pristine residential areas occupied by the affluent. This district sharply contrasts with the outer district, which appears relatively impoverished and less tidy. Su Hong returns home to find his sister, Su Ching, waiting for him. A loud voice pleads to stop the pain, as Su Hung's ear is twisted forcefully. His sister is reprimanding him, because she had ventured to the castle to find him, but was denied entry, leaving her waiting anxiously at the entrance. As she administers punishment by nearly tearing his ears off for disappearing, and suddenly returning, the siblings hear a knock at the door. Su Ching casually asks who it is, and a delivery boy responds that the fortress master has sent some goods for them. The man bows and presents a plate with stacks of gold coins and small gift bags, expressing his wish for Su Hum's beast to thrive. Hearing this, Su Ching realizes that her brother has successfully hatched his beast. She blushes with joy, a big smile spreading across her face, and then tightly hugs her brother. Overwhelmed with happiness, she realizes that the risk their parents took in selling her old home to send Su Hung for special training was not in vain. As the siblings remain tightly embraced, Su Hung notices that the delivery boy is still waiting. The three awkwardly stare at each other for a moment. His sister suddenly releases him and casually mentions that she has work today, leaving him in charge of taking care of the home. After Su Ching departs, Su Hung accepts the goods. He opens a box containing peculiar red dragon scales. As he holds them in his hand, the scales emit a golden aura. His eyes gleam with a brilliant yellow hue, and his back arches in the chair, as magical light radiates from his forehead, reminiscent of the same light magic that had knocked him unconscious on that starry night. Once again, he receives a vision of the golden book with a dragon imprinted on its cover, similar to what the great sage had held. Knowledge about dragons and wild beast evolutions suddenly floods into his mind. He expresses gratitude to whoever sent him this knowledge and ponders the revelation that lizards can evolve into dragons, despite adult dragons being classified as top-ranked dangerous species, whereas his lizard is only an intermediate-ranked danger level and seemingly an entirely separate species. He contemplates whether dragon bloodroot, akin to a common purple-brown root, could facilitate the envisioned ritual. Remembering the genius girl who had hatched a high-ranked danger species that impressed the fortress master enough to take her as his disciple, Su Hung's face lights up with determination. With a clenched fist and a passionate expression, he wonders about the possibility of securing the position of the fortress master's disciple by hatching a top-ranked species, a dragon. Su Hung promptly heads to the medicine shop, purchasing the necessary ingredients and mixing them as envisioned. Placing the sky-blue egg in a bowl filled with freshly prepared brown liquid, he kneels on the ground and meticulously draws a complex ritual circle using a feather and ink. Invoking his magic, he ignites the circle, causing it to radiate a golden aura with the egg at its center. The egg begins to glow within the bowl, projecting a spiritual image of a dragon that bursts forth, startling Su Hong with its brilliant light. He catches a fleeting glimpse of the dragon's silhouette, proudly spreading its wings. However, the scene quickly shifts back to the egg. A crackling sound is heard. Caught off guard by the further cracking of the eggshell, Su Hong wonders whether it will hatch into a dragon or remain a lizard. The scene shifts to the castle wall in the morning, with the sun rising, and trainees engaged in sparring. Lu Yu watches over them with a stern expression on her resolute face. Among the sparring trainees, there is speculation about Su Hong, whether he met his demise at home or has simply grown too arrogant to attend training. Suddenly, Lu Yu's violet eyes catch sight of Su Hong. With a frustrated tone, she sarcastically asks him if he has finally decided to return to training, instilling fear in the trainees that he will face severe punishment. Su Hong pleads with his trainer, explaining that he has a valid reason for his absence. In response, she demands that he provide a compelling explanation. With a smug expression, Su Hong turns around to reveal his backpack, from which peeks out a pair of cute, yet soulful blue eyes and hands. Our hero confidently meets the gaze of his tiny blue partner perched on his shoulder. The little blue dragon, with its glistening golden eyes, lets out a cute roar. At the sight of the blue beastling, everyone freezes in pure shock and fear. An intrigued trainee remarks that such intense pressure shouldn't come from a mere lizard beast, prompting Lu Yu to reluctantly declare that it is indeed a top-ranked danger species, the dragon. As the trainees gossip and murmur about Su Hong, Lu Yu escorts him once again to the castle lord, Zhou He. 
The man in gold plated armor slams his table and rises in astonishment. With a stern expression, he gazes at the cute little beast and its master, exclaiming that the newcomer has indeed hatched a top-ranked danger species from his very first wild beast egg. The castle lord points at Lu Yu and instructs her to immediately investigate who assigns Su Hong his egg, demanding a punishment of a three-month salary deduction for nearly jeopardizing the future of a promising genius capable of hatching a dragon. As he turns to face the genius of the hour, his face breaks into a smile, consoling Su Hong for the hardships he has endured over the past three years. The dignified lord congratulates Su Hong, acknowledging how he has already surpassed all his competitors, not just by hatching a high rank, but rather a top-ranked danger species. Su Hong elegantly vows never to disappoint the lord. Joey's expression turns serious once more. With a commendation to the dragon hatcher, he points a finger at him and presents a choice. Does Su Hung wish to become Zhou He's disciple? With a dignified hand pointing towards him, our hero is left speechless, while his dragon partner affectionately rubs its face against him. Even Lu Yu is taken aback by the declaration. She glances at the boy genius on her right, with the top-ranked danger beast on his shoulder, reflecting on how it has only been three years since the Lord took his first disciple, Bai Su Su, the girl who hatched a high-ranker danger species from her first wild beast egg. With a clenched fist over his bosom in a gesture of respect, Su Hong enthusiastically accepts the gracious offer, his blue dragon sporting a cheeky expression at his response. The dignified face of the castle lord shifts into a relaxed laugh, approving our hero's answer. He spreads his arms wide and instructs the elegant lady before him, Lu Yu, to extend invitations to all tamers for a banquet, celebrating the new talent and the arrival of the castle lord's second disciple. The scene shifts to a bustling castle illuminated under the starry sky, where the banquet unfolds until nightfall. Su Hung is escorted home with his sister and blue partner by carriage. Back at home, the siblings discuss the talented tamer's generous allowance of 100 grams of gold per month. The boy joyfully shares with his sister his plan to save enough to buy back the old house traded for his chance at success. Pinching her brother's cheek affectionately, his sister chuckles at the realization that even with three years of savings, she couldn't afford to buy back their old house. She showers him with adoration, proud of her little brother's achievements, despite him flinching from her playful teasing. The two part ways as Su Hong bids his sister good night, reminding her to rest before the next day's work. Now seated at his desk, Su Hong pours over the gleaming golden encyclopedia of wild beasts. He discovers that a creature's combat prowess hinges on its mastery of skills through energy manipulation. The encyclopedia details that dragon species possess six unique skills alongside their formidable attack abilities. The dragon's sleep not only magically heals physical injuries and swiftly replenishes energy, but it also dissipates fatigue with remarkable speed. Among the formidable innate skills of lower-ranked dragons are their intimidation through low-ranked dragon power and low-ranked dragon might. Moreover, the skill Earth Spear Sacrifice summons numerous sharp spears from the ground capable of devastating everything in the dragon's vicinity. As if these abilities weren't formidable enough, Earth Power Absorption allows dragons to draw energy from the Earth itself, enhancing their vitality. The combination of these two skills makes dragons a nearly invincible adversary, surpassing even the resilience of a cockroach. Stroking his chin in admiration of the skills, Su Hung gazes at his sleeping dragon partner, envisioning its potential future capabilities. However, this tender moment is interrupted by the sudden growth spurt of the baby dragon, expanding larger than its bowl-shaped bed and momentarily knocking Su Hung off balance. Awkwardly laughing at the dragon's rapid development, he marvels at its speed. As dawn breaks the next day, Su Hung sits opposite his new master in the tamer training room. Jelvi remarks on the potential of the young dragon, suggesting that Su Hung soon assesses its aptitude in the three different energy talents. The venerable master instructs his disciple to choose one of the three training plans revealing his own primary force as a demon type. He lifts his right hand, showcasing the dusky red aura emanating from the ring on his pointing finger, leaving Su Hong in awe of his teacher's tamer's seal. Su Hong recalls his understanding of the tamer's seal, a tool used to store multiple wild beasts within an internal space where they can rest and recover swiftly. This enables tamers to keep colossal adult wild beasts readily accessible, as it's impractical to have them constantly by their side. Hence, Various magical jewelry like rings, brooches, bracelets, and necklaces were created for this purpose. His gaze then follows a demonic creature, emerging from the tamer's seal, radiating ominous energy. A towering scarlet wolf demon with glowing red eyes and razor-sharp fangs stands before them. 
Joe he informs Su Hong that this wolf demon was initially a low rank creature, but through specialized training and nurturing, it ascended to high rank status. The master proudly places his hand on the wolf demon's snout, demonstrating its obedience, and explains that his primary demon serves as the ideal opponent to assess Su Hong's dragon. Su Hong furrows his brow while the young dragon tears up at the sight of its test partner. His master, while affectionately petting the wolf's enormous nose, explains that the demon beast is a hybrid, blending both demon and pure beast attributes. He then gestures to his disciple, instructing him to release the dragon beast from his arms without hesitation. A small creature stands opposite the towering wolf demon, overwhelmed by its size and trembling in fear. Su Han, standing beside his Shu height dragon partner, fixes off against his master and the colossal scarlet demon wolf. The blue dragon casts a worried glance at Su Hung, who encourages it with a wry smile. With no room for hesitation, Jovi commands his demon wolf to demonstrate its power by unleashing its demon breath. The scarlet wolf demon obediently opens its massive jaws, conjuring a ball of demonic energy amidst swirling magical waves. Suddenly, a scream commands the wolf demon to halt, leaving it puzzled as it dispels the lingering demon's breath, steam still drifting from its mouth. The master raises his hand, signaling that the demonstration is sufficient. Unexpectedly, Su Hung's attention shifts to his partner. All three of them gaze at the blue dragon, now emanating an ominous aura, its small face contorted in a terrifying expression, as magical energy swirls around it. Jovi acknowledges its rapid learning capability. Filled with anticipation, Su Hung raises his fists in excitement, and encourages his little partner to successfully execute his dragon breath. However, the miniature blue dragon suddenly hesitates, appearing distracted. With a cute poof, it fails to produce the dragon breath skill. Su Han laughs it off, but his teacher is impressed. He explains that the demon energy and purple smoke emitted by the small dragon were early signs of developing a full-fledged demon breath. Su Hong is advised to cherish his talented dragon partner. With the Scarlet Wolf demon having fulfilled its role, Jyothi raises his tamer seal, causing the large silhouette of the wolf demon to transform into demonic energy that swiftly flows into the ring. The talented duo watches in awe as the wolf demon vanishes, prompting the little dragon to exhale a sigh of relief. However, their momentary respite is short-lived as the master immediately summons a massive duck-like beast. The dragon beast once again freezes in fear as Jyothi reveals the identity of the wild beast a special rank, scary-type ground platypus with attributes of earth, demon, and beast. As Jovi commands the beast to play, it rushes towards Su Hung's feet in a panic, emitting a small cry, pleading for Su Hung to intervene and protect it. Our hero suggests that perhaps using a special rank, scary-type beast isn't the most suitable for early training. Understandingly, his teacher agrees, stroking his chin with a thoughtful expression. Soon after, a new beast is summoned an imposing creature with a massive blood-red talon, scalded skin, and three razor-sharp claws. Its mouth emits steam with each breath, and an enormous, thick tail covered in layers of dark scales exudes a deadly aura. With a powerful stance and a confident smile, Jogi declares that a special rank, scary-type beast, was indeed too weak a training partner for Su Hung's talented dragon. He introduces one of the finest members of his main force, a wild beast with attributes of fire, demon, dragon, and earth, and his soul dragon-type tamed beast. All other sounds are drowned out by the chilling roar of the T-Rex like dragon beast Yo he proudly presents. Lava Tyrannosaur. Someone call an ambulance. The little guy needs immediate medical attention. Su Hong's eyes remain fixed in fascination at the majestic dragon beast, while his own partner's eyes widen in terror. He raises his fist and inquires about the rarity of dragon-type beasts, curious about how his teacher came to possess one. Jovi calmly explains that dragon-type beasts are indeed extremely rare. He mentions that many tamers, even seasoned professionals, dream of taming a dragon-type, emphasizing that Su Hung's fortune in taming one as a beginner is astronomical. This realization dawns on Su Hung, prompting him to understand the importance of keeping the existence of his golden wild beast encyclopedia a secret. As the master and disciple stand opposite each other with their respective partners, Jody asks if Su Hong is prepared. The lava tyrannosaur fixes its gaze on the tiny blue dragon, causing it to tremble and tear up in fear. Without warning, Jody raises his right hand and commands his dragon beast to demonstrate a fraction of its dragon power, intending for Su Hong's small partner to experience and learn from it. 
In an instant, the dragon-type beast opens its immense jaws and unleashes a roar that sends powerful gusts of wind toward the student. Duo Su Hong braces himself against the intense pressure of the gusts, feeling as if he were a boat struggling in a tsunami, only managing to stay upright for sheer effort. However, Joby quickly intervenes, advising Su Hong to move out of the attack range and pulling him back. Suddenly, the forceful pressure from the roar dissipates. Su Hong, now sweating nervously, marvels at the incredible power the wild beast wields to unleash such force from a distance. Both teacher and student are taken aback when they witness the little blue dragon handling the attack remarkably well, demonstrating his role as a good master. Joe, he instructs his dragon beast to apply a bit more pressure to give the young dragon a challenge. With a fierce gleam in its eyes, the lava tyrannosaur unleashes another thunderous roar. The small dragon grips tightly with paw-like claws, clinging on desperately. The Jovi predicts it's reaching its limit. However, in a stunning turn of events, Jovi is astonished by the growing energy enveloping the tiny wild beast. He strokes his beard in amazement, realizing it's using its low-ranked dragon power to withstand the lava tyrannosaur's formidable dragon power. Alarming Su Hong, he explains how the talented little dragon has the potential to evolve into a creature far exceeding the limits of scary species, possibly achieving an unprecedented rank. Su Hong felt a surge of excitement akin to a child receiving a perfect grade, witnessing his partner's increasing strength. In a sudden moment of realization, Jovi recalls an important question. Whether Su Hung used the dragon scales he received when he hatched his wild beast egg, Su Hung promptly confirms that he used them as instructed, bringing his hand to his chin once more. Jovi is astonished by the dragon beast's ability to absorb the power from those scales so effectively, speculating that it may have inherited traits from the dragon blood within the scales. As they both observe the resilient dragon, Su Hung's master hypothesizes that this is why the dragon's talent of the beast surpasses all others. He then hands Su Hung a black book adorned with a floral pattern, explaining that it contains not only training methods and skills in the form of spirit seals, but also basic mental training techniques. Jo he reminds Su Hung of the importance of nurturing his mind, alongside his wild beast training. He explains the crucial role of the tamer's spiritual power as foundational in beast taming. With a cheerful smile and a salute, Su Hung gratefully accepts the gift from his teacher, and their training continues. After leaving the castle, Su Hung visits the old house his family had sold, where the seller's attitude swiftly changes upon learning he is now a prominent figure, a tamer. Su Hung decides to spruce up the place a bit, though he can't restore it to its former glory. He finds satisfaction in the memories, striking a confident pose with his dragon partner, perched on his shoulder. While enjoying time with his admirable companion, he realizes his sister isn't aware of the exciting news about reclaiming their old house. Determined to surprise her, he picks her up from work, filled with excitement like a young boy heading to the park for the first time. The scene shifts to two fierce hounds, howling with saliva dripping from their mouths. The object of their attention is none other than Su Ching, whose shrieks echo through the area. Upon hearing a voice, Su Hong swiftly turns his head towards the sound. Recognizing his sister's scream, he follows it urgently. It turns out that Su Ching is being harassed by three lecherous beast tamers who are using their dogs to block her path, intending to flirt with her. One of them, sporting a ridiculous hairstyle, pressures her, suggesting that if she agrees to spend the night with him, he will stop using his dogs to intimidate her. Suddenly, a furious Su Hung interrupts the exchange. He rushes in, holding a brick in his right hand, and strikes one of the dogs squarely, shocking the trio of harassers. The injured dog yelps in pain, causing everyone to pause and look at it for a moment. Su Hung then confronts the troublemaker in blue, warning them to steer clear of his sister, unimpressed by his father's wealth and influence. The spoiled hoodlum, initially stunned by the injury to his dog Charlie, quickly shifts to frustration, mouth hanging open. In a fit of rage, the man in blue points at Su Hung and orders his second dog, Jack, to attack and kill our hero. The large black dog charges at the siblings aggressively. Su Ching stammers, urging her brother to flee, but the dog swiftly lunges towards Su Hung, who instinctively shields his elder sister. Momentarily vulnerable, Su Hung flinches, protecting his face with his arms, but the blue dragon beast lets out a small roar before tackling the dog in its chest. Seeing his loyal companion's brave act, Su Hung looks down to find the incapacitated dog being bitten by the dragon beast. Ironically, Su Hung now commands his pet to attack the enemy, a command the miniature dragon eagerly obeys, with pieces of the dog in its tiny jaws. 
The trio of harassers stare in terror, sweat dripping profusely. The spoiled man in blue is furious at the loss of his two dogs. Seeking revenge, he orders the others to draw their hidden knives and attempt to kill Su Hung. The three rush towards Su Hung clumsily, brandishing their small knives while both Su Hung and his sister look on in disbelief. Su Hung commands his companion to unleash its dragon power, transforming the cute face of the little dragon into a fierce visage. Demonic energy swirls around the beast's mouth, causing the trio to freeze in their tracks. The lackeys caution that this could be dangerous and suggest proceeding cautiously, when their confrontation is interrupted by a voice inquiring about the situation. Three suited guards approach the trio from behind, emboldening them to believe they can leverage their influence to have Su Hong arrested. The man in blue, driven by perverse fantasies, imagines that imprisoning Su Hong will grant him the freedom to pursue his desires. He eyes Su Ching, the woman protected by our hero with lecherous intent, snorting with satisfaction at the thought of his potential actions, to the extent that he deems the loss of his dogs a fair trade. A guard in a suit with slicked back hair addresses the perverted gangster as young Master Gu, striking a pose of inquiry as he questions the trio about their actions. The siblings watch in quiet bewilderment. Young Master Gu accuses Su Hong of brutally killing his dogs, appealing to Captain Zheng, the black-clad guard. He requests that Captain Zheng arrest Su Hong for this alleged crime, leaving the accused in disbelief. Captain Zheng swiftly orders the other guards to restrain and handcuff Su Hong. They taunt him, insisting he surrenders quietly for the grievous offense of killing young Master Gu's beloved dogs, approaching the siblings with law enforcement tools in hand. The two guards abruptly halt as a brick lands in their midst. With a hint of sarcasm, Su Hong boldly suggests they blame the brick for young Master Gu's dog's demise, as if to mock their absurdity. How can he possibly say that with a straight face? The two guards see with anger, their pistols and handcuffs at the ready. They are stunned by the audacity displayed by a mere boy towards law enforcement. However, their fury is short-lived as a small blue creature peeks out from behind Su Hung's shoulder. A single glance from the tame beast causes both guards to stiffen. And if that wasn't enough, Su Hung proudly raises an ID that reveals his status as a renowned beast tamer. The guards are left dumbfounded as they realize the gravity of the situation. They turn to their superior, who breaks out into a cold sweat. Thoughts race through his mind about the legendary tamer, who was taken in as a disciple by the ward of the castle. His hands tremble as he grips his pistol, fearful that the boy standing before him might indeed be that famed dragon tamer. The situation takes a dramatic turn as Captain Zheng, who previously followed young master Gu's commands, raises his pistol and declares the situation suspicious. He swiftly turns the tables, aiming his firearm at the trio of troublemakers and accusing them of their presumptuous crimes on the street, leaving them bewildered by the sudden shift. In their duty as law enforcement officers, the two guards immediately comply with Captain Zheng's orders to handcuff the three criminals, even prepared to use lethal force if met with resistance. The spoiled young master Gu protests Captain Zheng, claiming he's being wrongly arrested and portraying himself as a victim. In a panic, sweating profusely, Gu stoops to threaten Captain Zheng. With his father's influential position as director of Plantation 5, without hesitation, Captain Zheng responds by delivering a swift jab to Gu's cheek, knocking out one of his teeth. Acting as if nothing happened, he then instructs his subordinates to slap the disrespectful criminal for his insolence towards an officer of the law. The two guards administer a thorough beating to the criminal, ensuring he won't soon forget the lesson. Captain Zheng then ingratiates himself with our protagonist, expressing gratitude to Su Hong for intervening and preventing the spoiled young master from engaging in criminal acts with his dogs. Stu Hong responds with a haughty demeanor, acknowledging Zheng's duty, but asserting his own role firmly. Zheng, eager to please, thanks the tamer for his acknowledgement. Taking it a step further, he assures Su Hong that the three tied-up ruffians will face further punishment. Su Hong, with a serious expression, remarks that this is only a partial resolution. He intends to pursue the pervert even after his prison term ends. Under the pressure of the tamer's words, Captain Zheng, sweating nervously, reluctantly agrees. With a shift in his mood, Su Hong turns to his sister with a cheerful expression, reassuring her that everything has been resolved, and they can finally head home. She returns his smile and nods in agreement. Hand in hand, they begin their journey towards home sweet home, walking off into the sunset. Meanwhile, Captain Zheng queries his subordinates about which is worse to offend, a plantation director or a beast tamer. Hesitantly, his subordinate replies that the consequences of offending a beast tamer would be unimaginable. 
satisfied with the answer. Jean pats his subordinate approvingly on the shoulder and instructs them to procure a vehicle to transport the trio of troublemakers to a garbage incineration site. After a suspenseful pause, he casually orders their execution, leaving the three trembling in fear of their impending fate. With the demeanor of a seasoned mafioso, Jum gestures as if to convey their doom. The scene shifts to the siblings, now standing outside their old house. Su Cheng's eyes light up with joy, as she revels in the nostalgia of being back home. Describing it as a dream come true, Stu Hung smiles and teasingly shows her that he still holds the keys, playfully preventing her from entering. He reassures her with a promise that life will only improve from here on out. Inside the house, sitting at a table, Su Ching cheerfully expresses her confidence in her little brother, tightly gripping his hands. They laugh together, envisioning a brighter future ahead. Suddenly, Su Hung's attention is drawn by a knock at the door. The dragon tamer opens the door with his little sidekick perched on his shoulder, finding a sophisticated middle-aged man with almond-colored hair standing there. The man seems oddly familiar, wearing an awkward smile, as he introduces himself as Deputy Director Guo from the Plantation Management Office. Su Cheng peeks out from behind her brother and asks the Deputy Director the reason for his visit. Maintaining his fake smile, Deputy Director Guo informs them that he has received news from the security agency regarding an incident involving young Master Gu offending the renowned tamer, Chu Ding Chuan. With a grin, he states that then it is his responsibility to punish this offense by transferring the high-ranking official to a third-tier plantation, where he will perform the duties of an ordinary farmer. He hesitantly asks Su Hong if this arrangement meets his approval, leaving Su Ching looking puzzled, but Su Hong agrees with a confident nod. To further appease the tamer, Deputy Director Guo mentions that Su Ching holds a senior agronomist position on his plantation. He proposes transferring her to the agronomy department of his management office, offering her the role of deputy director. Wow, that's a surprisingly large amount of compensation for bullying. However, Su Ching shyly furrows her brows and humbly expresses doubt about her suitability for the position, offered by deputy director Guo. Undeterred, the director immediately begins to grovel, joining his hands together and pleading with her to accept the role. He argues that she is perfectly qualified especially considering she is the esteemed Su Hung's sister. He goes further, offering personal assistance to solve any issues she might encounter. In response to his earnest plea, Stu Ching gladly accepts the offer, while her brother looks on awkwardly at the unexpected turn of the job negotiation. Stu Hung strokes his small companion affectionately, as he imagines the benefits and privileges that will come with his growing strength. Later, inside the house, he is seen pouring what appears to be radioactive rice feed, emitting a green aura into a bowl for his partner. He instructs the startled beast to consume the sizable portion, claiming it's a special recipe designed to accelerate the dragon beast's growth. The creature looks up at him with pleading eyes, sidledly urging mercy for its stomach. Taking heed of its discomfort, the yum tamer consults his teacher's guidebook on wild beast nutrition formulas, which range from inferior to extraordinary, and even perfect. According to the guidebook, the recipe he's using ranks as a high-quality formula for demon-type beasts, a valuable find for an amateur-level tamer like himself. As his companion pushes away the overly filled bowl of food after only a couple of bites, Su Hong dives into his guidebook to understand the reason behind its reluctance. He initially suspects the ingredients eyeing the pile of gray fish corpses on the table. Suddenly, he remembers he possesses the revered golden book on wild beasts and begins poring over its pages his partner watching him intently. Flipping through the book, Su Hong discovers a passage explaining that dragons often lose their appetite for a long period after consuming the eggshells they hatch from. Due to their unique combination of earth and dragon attributes, their diet lacks balance, and they are selective eaters, preferring live foods such as freshly caught fish. Having a moment of realization, Su Hong gently pets his perplexed dragon, assuring it that he will adjust its diet accordingly. Su Hung strikes a triumphant pose, pointing confidently to the sky as he declares his plan to secure funding from his teacher for the best food to help his pet grow rapidly. His little companion's eyes sparkle with delight at the prospect. Over the next few days, Su Hung develops a routine of visiting fishermen to purchase fresh seafood, meticulously preparing meals based on recipes from the Golden Book. His small partner eagerly consumes the freshly prepared feed, its scales glowing red with satisfaction. However, a problem soon arises when Su Hung tearfully examines the pouch that had been full of gold coins just five days prior, now completely empty. 
As he shakes the pouch in disbelief, a single gold coin drops out, rolling across the wooden floor until it bumps against the tail of a thick, blue creature adorned with golden spikes. Standing before the food bowl is a majestic dragon, towering over most humans, its innocent expression betraying a hint of confusion as it gazes at its master. In just five days, the special recipe has transformed the once small dragon pet into a juvenile stage beast, much larger and more formidable. Su Hung clenches his fists in satisfaction, tears of both joy and sadness welling his eyes, joy for the success of his efforts in nurturing his companion, and sadness for the financial strain it has brought. Raising kids is hard enough already, but dragon? That's a whole new level. Su Hung contemplates how the two dogs that had posed a significant challenge for his dragon previously would now be effortlessly dealt with. He envisions his towering blue dragon effortlessly flying and diving onto the dogs, using its formidable claws and powerful jaws to tear them apart in countless ways. The dragon's newfound strength makes the once formidable dogs seem like trivial threats, no longer requiring the use of its special skills to eliminate them. Su Hong strokes the feasting dragon, marveling how impervious it seems to any harm from normal humans and their weapons, including guns. The dragon startles him with a disapproving frown as he disturbs its lunch, a fish clan firmly in its jaws, recollecting his teacher's instructions about notifying him once the dragon reaches the juvenile stage. Su Hong cautiously considers that achieving this stage solely through the recipe from the Golden Book might indicate a secret, perfect level formula. After careful thought, our hero devises a plan. He will prioritize training the juvenile dragon's skills and restrict its food intake for the next 10 days. He raises his fist with determination, ready to embark on this next phase of their journey together. The next day arrives, and the prodigious Tamer arrives at the castle with his now juvenile stage dragon. He knocks on the imposing wooden door and enters upon receiving permission. Inside, Castle Lord Joe, he greets him with a frown, questioning the reason for his prolonged absence and suggesting he might have been slacking off. With a blush and a wide grin, Soon Hung humbly explains that he was occupied nurturing his partner with a special recipe gifted by his teacher, which kept him from attending training exercises. As Su Hung pets the large juvenile dragon and explains how the food formula has accelerated its growth, Castle Lord Zhou He, typically composed, is momentarily dumbfounded by the dragon's astonishingly rapid development. Su Hung beams innocently as Zhou He scratches his cheek, remarking casually on the speed of the dragon's growth. Suddenly, Zhou He swiftly moves to give Su Hung a chop on the head, admonishing him that his first disciple, Bai Su Su's Ice Lotus Beast, took a whole month to reach a comparable growth stage. The teacher places his hand reassuringly on Su Hung's shoulder and explains that he should consider himself fortunate, as the Ice Lotus Beast is ranked two danger levels below his dragon. Su Hung breathes a sigh of relief, reassured that his teacher doesn't appear inclined to investigate the abnormal growth rate further. Proudly, the master compliments his disciple on his multifaceted talents with satisfaction. As the teacher and juvenile dragon stand face to face, Jogi mentions how breasts develop skills as they reach maturity and asks Su Hong what skills his dragon has developed. The tamer explains that dragon power is split into two level one subskills. Dragon power, deterrence, and dragon power might shock to intimidate foes. Additionally, demon breath has evolved into level one shadow ball. Once again, Jogi's mouth gapes open in astonishment at how quickly the dragon's skills were developed while his disciple smiles cheerfully, enjoying the reaction. With childlike innocence, Su Hong praises his teacher's teaching prowess, complimenting him on being so effective. Internally, he suppresses a smile, relieved that he didn't mention the other two skills, Earth Spear Sacrifice and Evil Assault, that he tested on the rooftop the previous night. The master then compliments his student once more, affirming his decision to choose such a talented wild beast tamer. He invites Su Hong to his special training ground, to further test the now grown up blue dragon beast. The master and his disciple stand apart in a vast arena, exclusively built for the esteemed, long haired castle lord. Joey suggests that Su Hung push his partner to perform at its fullest potential, promising to reward their progress with a tame seal, a crucial tool as Su Hung's dragon continues to grow larger. Teasingly, the castle lord questions how Su Hung can call himself a tamer without such a seal. Su Hung cheers up, focusing intently on his dragon. Realizing that obtaining a tamer's seal hinges on his partner's performance. With a smug expression, Jogi raises his hand, summoning a formidable armored rock bear. A bear covered head to toe in solid armor plates, making it a fearsome sight. Su Hong and his dragon 
stare in awe at the imposing wild beast. Confused, Su Hong asks how many such beasts the master possesses, considering he summons a new one each time. The long haired man confidently asserts that he only keeps formidable beasts, mentioning he has around 20 scary types and half that number of standard powerful beasts, causing Su Hong to nervously sweat. Joby fixes his gaze on his disciple, teasing him about the Tamer Seal reward, then initiates the test by commanding his armored bear beast to attack. With a resounding, harrowing roar, the armored bear unleashes a powerful gale. Su Hong and his dragon are caught off guard by the gusts of wind assaulting them. Enraged, the juvenile dragon activates its dragon power, deterrent skill on its own accord. Joey strokes his chin, intrigued by the dragon's resilience at its current growth stage, and promptly orders the bear beast to cease its roar. He then offers to take it easy on the duo for the test, instructing them to use the demon breath skill. Su Hong directs his blue dragon to unleash his upgraded skill, Demon Breath. Shadow Ball. The juvenile dragon swiftly gathers demonic energy in its mouth, forming a dense sphere of destruction, and unleashes it with formidable force. The Shadow Ball strikes the armored rock bear squarely on its left brow. However, to everyone's surprise, the bear rolls its eyes at the impact site, showing no signs of damage. Joey chuckles, teasing Su Hong about whether his dragon has eaten anything. Given how the low energy ball barely tickled his armored bear, Su Hong, wearing a villainous smirk, reveals that this outcome was exactly as he anticipated. He commands his dragon to continue using the skill in a relentless barrage. With determination gleaming in its golden eyes, the blue dragon hurls shadow balls one after another at the bear beast's forehead. The constant barrage finally manages to break through the armor, catching the bear and its master off guard. Jovi praises the two trainees. For developing the skill without guidance, noting their excellent use of demonic energy with precise aim and a rapid firing rate, Su Hum graciously accepts the compliments, though he continues to ponder how his dragon struggled to penetrate the bear's defenses. True to his word, Jovi presents the Tamer's Seal, a ring inscribed with Fire Royal Guard, capable of holding up to five tamed beasts. The master congratulates his disciple, assuring him that he no longer needs to worry about the size of his beasts since the ring can accommodate ten tamed beasts if they are willing to share the extra space. That's like asking to be downgraded from first class to economy. Su Hum graciously accepts the reward and expresses his gratitude to his teacher. Joe, he then humbles the talented tamer, cautioning him not to become overconfident despite his dragon's impressive skills, lacking real combat experience. Placing his hands on Su Hum's shoulders, Joe, he explains that true combat experience can only be gained through actual battles, Therefore, he has arranged for Su Hong to engage with dangerous species at a garrison in the north. He instructs Su Hong to report to the military headquarters at the garrison in three days' time to receive his mission. The scene shifts, revealing that the Black Light Gathering Place is heavily fortified with four defense lines outside its tower and walls. These lines are manned by fortresses, tamers, and regular human soldiers, armed with weapons, it is well known that the North and South defense lines face regular engagements with the most dangerous species, with battles occurring almost daily. In addition to defending the gathering place, these defense lines also serve as sources of valuable materials, obtained from the remains of dangerous species. Su Hong has requested an advance allowance of 250,000 grams of steel, half of which he intends to spend on the special dragon food. Over the next three days, he meticulously prepares dragon food that can be preserved for future use. Having received his appointment letter arranged by his teacher, Su Hong reflects as he gazes out of his car window about the plantations that played a crucial role in establishing the four defense lines. These plantations are vital because no food can be grown within the confined space inside the high walls of the gathering place. Since the seven plantations inside the gathering area cannot produce enough food for the 50 to 60,000 residents, the workers in these outer plantations endure one of the most perilous jobs, second only to the search team members. This makes the area often a target for companies looking to permanently remove residents. Su Hong recalls the memory of Chu Ding Chuan, the demoted plantation director and father of the perverted young master Gu, who has been assigned to the 30th plantation. Stu Hong's green escort car comes to a stop, and as he steps out, a guard respectfully informs him that they have arrived at the 7th guard post, where he must report back to his duty. A brown-haired middle-aged guard, Standing atop the fortress wall watches in disbelief as the newcomer is personally escorted by the chief staff. A blonde man wearing a bandana explains to him that the newcomer is a tamer, and all the food he has brought is for his tamed beast. 
The two guards' faces turn pale, as they realize they are supposed to receive the esteemed Tamer, and assist him with his luggage. They rush at top speed, out of breath, to greet Su Hung, addressing him as Lord Su, and eagerly offering to carry his bags of tamed beast food. With surprising strength, they lift the bags onto their shoulders like obedient butlers, leaving Su Hung bewildered by their eagerness. The middle-aged guard with brown hair gives him a thumbs up and formally welcomes him. When the middle-aged man, Huang, suggests that Su Hung call him little brother, due to their status difference, Su Hung reluctantly declines and respectfully insists on addressing him as brother Huang, due to their age gap. Huang is deeply moved, shedding tears and encountering the first hammer he's seen, without a narcissistic ego. He swiftly commands everyone to expedite the unloading of cargo. The view reveals the imposing fortress of the Seventh Guard Post, one of 29 in the Northern Defense Line. Ten years prior, a powerful monster had completely razed the original Seventh Post, leaving only ruins. It is upon these remnants that the new Seventh Post has been constructed, marking the site where Su Han will face real battles. Seated in his brown clothed attire denoting his status, Su Hung is served noodles by Huang. Huang suggests that Su Hung try food prepared by Ah Wan, who, despite not being a professional cook, possesses exceptional culinary skills. He respectfully refers to Su Hung as Sir Su. Out of respect, Su Hung insists that Huang stop addressing him as Sir or Lord, emphasizing that they are comrades at the Seventh Guard Post. Huang, however, persists in at least calling him Brother Su, citing Su Hung's status as a Tanra Lord. Eventually, after an unusual exchange, they settle on calling each other Brother Huang and Brother Su. As they dine together, Su Hung inquires about the frequency of attacks by high-ranked danger species at their fortress. The blonde guard in the black bandana explains that their defense system is in the middle periphery, not as exposed as the outer areas and thus not under as much pressure. Between hearty bites of meat, he displays various colored remains of beasts they recently hunted, detailing how officers assess military merit points monthly and distribute rewards based on these points, including handling the transport of remains. Su Hong is amazed by the accomplishments of the brave men, who have achieved so much without relying on tamed beasts, which cheers up Ah Wan, who has blonde hair. The third man at the table, with purple hair, excitedly asks Su Hong to show them his tamed beast. Huang reprimands the others for their request, reminding them that tamed beasts cannot be summoned for trivial reasons. Despite their expectations, Su Hong stands up enthusiastically and displays his tamer's seal ring. Instantly, a blue dragon materializes from it. The soldiers are stunned and scream in shock. At the appearance of such a dangerous species, the dragon lands gracefully by its master's side, as Su Hung casually introduces his beast partner. The purple-haired guard expresses admiration and amazement at Su Hung for possessing a top-ranked danger species as his tamed beast. Annoyed by the excited man's lack of fear, the mischievous blue dragon unleashes its intimidating dragon might, sending him into a state of fear and cold sweat. Su Hung quickly intervenes, flicking the dragon and delivering a verbal reprimand for its rudeness, causing the dragon to sob slightly. He promptly apologizes to the purple-haired guard, checking if he is alright. The guard brushes off the incident and compliments Su Hung, expressing admiration for his impressive tamed beast. Meanwhile, the man in the bandana bursts into laughter, teasing him about nearly losing his composure and fear, causing his face to redden with embarrassment. Despite his denial, the group continues laughing so hard that their voices echo throughout the fortress. As Mike falls, Su Hung bonds with the five men, who have become like brothers to him, enjoying lively conversations and laughter alongside his tame dragon. Without wasting a moment's time, when they return to their lodgings, Su Hung's dragon sleeps peacefully beside him, while he meditates deeply focusing on cultivating his mind as taught by his teacher. He practices the crystal breathing tempering method, a three-step technique passed down by Master Zhou He. First, he closes his eyes and visualizes himself as a crystal within his meditation environment. Second, he synchronizes his breathing with a special frequency until his mind harmonizes with the meditative state. As he completes this final step, focusing on mind tempering, a blue aura swirls around him causing his road to lift slightly off the ground. However, upon opening his eyes, Su Hung realizes that achieving the soul crystal level, as mentioned by his teacher, will take considerable time at his current pace. Reflecting on the task ahead, he estimates it might require 15 days or even longer. Sitting cross-legged, he gazes at the bright half-moon behind him, 
Contemplating how his senior Bai Su Su managed to master the tempering technique in just one month, a feat he finds almost monstrous. Suddenly, alarms blare throughout the fortress, alerting Su Hong that an emergency situation has arisen. Huang hurriedly opens his door and informs Su Hong of the troubling news. Under the sickle shaped moon shining brightly in the night sky, groups of large mantis like red beasts soar through the air, spotted through binoculars by our Tamer hero as he peers out of a window with Huan beside him. He describes the beast's armored bodies and sickle like appendages, capable of slicing through bricks effortlessly. Lowering his binoculars, he informs Huan that these dangerous creatures have reached maturity. Reflecting on this, Kumon considers the situation and reveals that sickle beasts are frequently encountered at the northern defense line. Their primary threat, however, stems from their rapid reproductive capabilities. Huang remains unfazed, assessing that they only need to confront four of the beasts. Consequently, he directs his four subordinates to prepare for the engagement. Strategically, he decides to wield the sentry machine gun alongside Lao Yu, assigning Ah Wan to smite toward the northwest. Additionally, he orders Hu and Lu to secure positions at the 5th and 6th shooting trenches. In his final instructions, Huang assigns Ah Wan and Hu of Fu to eliminate the three mature beasts, tasking Su Hong with handling the still developing creature. The soldiers recognize their responsibilities with their affirmative responses resonating from the Grey Fortress Tower. Their rifles discharge with a bang, sending a golden bullet swiftly toward their enemy, the Red Sickle Beasts. One of these perilous creatures employs its ability. Stents, creating a red octagon pattern barrier around itself. This barrier deflects all incoming bullets, causing the deadly golden projectiles to crumple upon contact. The barrier, however, is nullified by a powerful shot that just grazes the beast's shoulder. It is revealed that Captain Huang fired a shot, accompanied by Su Hung and Lao Yu, who operate the sentry machine gun. Lao Yu shouts the command to aim for the head, noting that the corpse will be more valuable that way. Su Hong reflects on the beast's armor coverage skill, recognizing that while it isn't very strong, it still significantly weakens the impact of regular bullets. As Su Hong's attention shifts to the blonde sniper above him, he realizes how the guards strategically employ the machine gun to create an opening in the monster's barrier, allowing the sniper to take the final lethal shot. Su Hong raises his binoculars again, focusing on a beast under fire with its barrier up. He observes that as soon as a weak point forms in the barrier, a one. The blonde sniper seizes the opportunity and takes the shot, blasting the sickle beast's neck cleanly off its torso. Su Hung, lowering his binoculars, stares in amazement at the performance of the northern defense line. He commends the skillful men for their impeccable teamwork, honed through numerous battles, which enables them to overcome any dangerous species, despite not being tamers. The blonde sniper's relentless assault utterly mutilates the red sickle beasts, causing the last of them to suddenly flee in fear. Captain Huang, along with Su Hang, shouts an order to their junior, Hu, who is running behind them, to join their hunt for the fleeing sickle beast. Upon acknowledging the command, the three of them enter a green jeep, which speeds off quickly. The purple-haired humans the machine gun on the roof, as the jeep rapidly chases the red sickle beast, which is running for its life. With a swift maneuver by Captain Huang driving the jeep, they manage to block the beast's path. The beast stares menacingly at them as the two sides face each other. Su Hung gets off the jeep and walks slowly toward his foe. Huang orders Hu to be extra cautious, watching for any unusual movements to prevent the inexperienced tamer from the inner city from getting injured. This makes the man at the machine gun sweat nervously as he follows his orders, keeping a vigilant eye on the scene. As Su Hung faces the red sickle beast, he initiates the battle by summoning his dragon and launching a devil assault to gauge the enemy's strength. His blue dragon swiftly ascends and dives straight at the beast, prompting it to activate its barrier skill. Despite the barrier, the dragon's sheer speed and power enable it to break through the octagon pattern shield, ramming the beast with its head and sending it flying backward. The red beast finally comes to a halt, leaving a trail of dust as it skids to a stop, now emitting a furious hiss. Stu Hung observes that it sustained minimal damage due to its armor absorbing most of the impact. He then directs his blue partner to unleash a continuous barrage of shadow balls, causing the dragon to launch a series of purple bullets infused with demonic energy at its adversary. The armored sickle beast once again deploys its barrier, which effectively absorbs the shadow balls, surprising Su Hung with its resilience. Suddenly, the beast assumes a menacing posture, and energy starts gathering around its body. 
Su Hung swiftly reacts by commanding his partner to employ the intimidating skill of dragon power deterrence. The dragon adopts a terrifying countenance and unleashes a deafening roar at the sickle beast, completely stunning it. Now trembling in fear, the beast is unable to react. Not wasting this opportunity, at Su Hung's directive, the blue dragon harnesses its draconic power and mercilessly tears into its foe, brutally swiping its claw across the beast's face. Upon being struck, the beast uses the momentum to pivot and make another attempt to flee, leaving the tamer and his dragon watching intently. Su Hong laughs and declares they won't let the beast escape, commanding his dragon to execute the Earth Spear sacrifice. A thick blue limb strikes the ground, unleashing a path of destruction toward the red sickle beast. The attack culminates in spikes erupting from the earth, piercing the beast's armored body at two critical points. The two guards in the jeep are left speechless by the intense battle they have just witnessed. Hu, sweating and laughing nervously, remarks to Captain Huang that he doesn't believe Su Hong needs their assistance, while the captain stares in awe at the spectacle unfolding before his eyes. The following day, at the fortress, Hu passionately recounts the previous night's battle between Su Hong and the sickle beast. Captain Huang places a hand on his shoulder and praises him for truly living up to his title. While Su Hong graciously acknowledges the team's collective effort, a guard suddenly rushes up to Captain Huang and discreetly alerts him to the approach of visitors. Su Hong advises immediate action, prompting them to sprint towards the fortress walls for a vantage point. From there, they observe a convoy from headquarters arriving below. Huang ponders aloud the reason behind headquarters, sending a convoy instead of individuals to the sentry post, noting the unusually early morning arrival instead of the typical noon schedule. 